built the Earth. The last time we had a major fall of a carbonaceous chondrite was 30 years ago. So that means that it's about one time in a career you had this happening to you, and to have it happen to, to me in my career while I was still young enough to take advantage of it was a very exciting thing for me. A team of scientists scrambled to collect as much of the meteorite as possible. This was the opportunity of a lifetime. More than 400 fragments strewn across the frozen lake could each contain clues to the very beginning of Earth. Scientists hoped that inside, the fragments would be uncontaminated in the same pristine condition as when they formed four and a half billion years ago. If it lives up to expectations, this meteorite could reveal the exact chemistry of the dust grains that built the newborn Earth. Meteorites are a window on the past. And they tell us something about the conditions in which the solid planets formed. This picker meteorite is, is really special. In the first place, it has the highest carbon content of any meteorite and the highest amount of these preserved interstellar stardust grains of any meteorite. and has a very high water content as well. In addition, about 90 other elements have been identified. And already, they're providing a chemical fingerprint of early Earth. And within this meteorite are radioactive elements that decay at a precisely known rate, allowing scientists to calculate the meteorite's age. And since most meteorites formed at the same time as the planets, and from the same material, the age of the meteorite gives you the age of Earth and its neighbors. If you date meteorites, uh, what you find is that uh, almost all meteorites have the same age, about 4.55 billion years old. They're all the same age, it's pretty monotonous. Within a couple of tens of millions of years to hundreds of millions of years, they all have exactly the same age. And so what we do is take the oldest of these ages and use that as the initial age of the solar system. That narrow range of ages indicates that all meteorites and planets coalesced extremely quickly in the early days of the solar system. But Earth had barely taken shape before the first of several major disasters struck the young planet. Earth's gravity was pulling in huge quantities of debris from space. A continual bombardment that generated enormous amounts of heat on the surface. At the same time, radioactive elements trapped deep within the Earth were decaying, producing even more heat and roasting the planet from the inside. The combined effect was catastrophic. By eight minutes after midnight on our 24-hour clock, the planet had become a raging furnace. And when the temperature reached thousands of degrees, dense metals such as iron and nickel in Earth's rocky surface melted. The outer part of the Earth would have been completely molten. We call that a magma ocean. It's a liquid rock ocean, hundreds of kilometers thick. Do you think the Earth at some point was a big droplet of melt just floating in space? When you have a totally molten object like this, the heaviest elements, and that includes things like iron, uh, would sink to the center of this droplet. And the lightest elements, things rich in, in carbon and water, for instance, or light elements, would float to the top and float there like, like algae on a lake. The global migration of the elements, known as the Iron Catastrophe, 
would have a profound effect on the future of our planet. The sinking iron accumulated at Earth's center, where it created a molten core twice the size of the moon. The liquid iron is constantly swirling and flowing. And even today, this motion generates electric currents, which turned our planet into a giant magnet with north and south poles. The core is still in constant motion. And we can see evidence of Earth's liquid iron core on the cold, snowy wastes of Arctic Canada. Well, the magnetic field is constantly fluctuating on a minute-to-minute minute or even second-to-second second basis. And one result of this is the fact that it causes the magnetic pole to actually move randomly over the course of a day. Every few years, geologist Larry Newitt sets out in search of the precise location of the magnetic north pole, or north on a compass. Newitt spends days at a time on the ice, in temperatures as low as minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The geographic North Pole is in a fixed position, but the magnetic pole is always on the move. Over the last century, its position has changed dramatically. Get going. To identify the pole's current position, Newitt measures the strength and direction of the magnetic field at about eight different sites, then closes in on it. 89, 13.0. Since we don't know where the pole is, we can't just go there and take a reading. So we surround it, and then I uh, determine its location by a process of, uh, well, what amounts to triangulation. 268, 35.0. At the time of the most recent survey, the pole had moved 125 miles off the Canadian coast. And Newitt and his colleagues have discovered something curious. Its movement is picking up speed. Over much of uh, the past uh, 100 years, it's been around 10 kilometers per year. But since about 1970, it started to accelerate. And now it's moving along at about 40 uh, kilometers per year. If this keeps up, it'll reach uh, Siberia in about another 40 or 50 years. But of course, that's a rather dangerous extrapolation. We don't really know where it's going to go. Without Earth's liquid iron core, life would be in trouble. This swirling ball of molten iron is what generates the magnetic field around our planet. And we need that magnetic field because every day, a deadly stream of electrically charged particles bombards the Earth. Ejected by the sun in monstrous solar flares, these particles hurtle through space at about a million miles an hour. 